Oh, interesting. Well, we are live, but Twitter is trying to extract uh, services from me in order to stream on the channel. That's inter interesting. So <laughs> now, now I have to like upgrade to stream. That's really nice. I didn't know that. Anyway, here we are. So yeah, thanks, Elon Musk. The love letter is in the mail. So, uh, welcome everyone, and please uh, type in a comment or two so I know that the LinkedIn commenting integration is working. LinkedIn's been a little glitchy lately, so please help me out there. Uh, and today I have Bob Barb Mushers. Zink, how you doing? I am doing great. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, glad to have you. Barb and I have a long-standing relationship for Diginomica now. Uh, no. Barb's been Barb's been our digital, mark, digital marketing lead at Digital for a long time now. So we've had a lot of great back and forth over the years, but this is our first live show together. So that's cool. Yep. And we're here for a very spicy and I think important topic, which is generative AI and creativity. So um, this is a topic that is in part of my workshopping series. And the thing I like about this series is that I get to kick things around and kick things around with you all as well. And then we come up with some hopefully better ideas that I can eventually use in writing and maybe even create some methodologies around it. But first, it's got to be workshop, which takes a lot of our pressure off because we can just riff a little bit and see if we get anywhere. Um, Thomas Weberknight is here. Thomas, how's that for the name pronunciation? I think that was better than when you were on the show. Thomas was in the first uh, workshopping for this topic. Uh, this is now the third. And in fact, when we did the first, at the same time, you wrote, I think, a really compelling uh, blog post on this topic at the same day. So I didn't incorporate it into the show except in passing, but it was called Is Content Creation the Best Use for Generative AI in Marketing? And that really struck a chord with me. And so we're going to talk about that uh, today and sort of your inspiration behind the post and all that stuff. Um, I do want to uh, say before I get too far that I've started to codify some of my views on this, thanks to the workshopping. So I'm going to summarize a few views, but I actually wrote about Barb's piece in my Enterprise Hits and Misses Roundup, and my quick response to is content creation the best use for generative AI and marketing? Uh, my answer, you can probably guess, an emphatic no. Via the proliferation of jargon-laden tech marketing copy from our helpful Gen AI bots, content becomes a commodity. Just who will be reading all this instant mediocrity? Marketers don't seem to have good answer to that. So that was kind of where I started, but I think there is actually a lot more to it than that. This is a very complicated and nuanced topic, and that was kind of a hot take. Uh, but there's a lot more to it. And I, I want to just summarize a few of the views that are kind of coming together for me. And I have a confession to make. Last night, I was working with a friend on his uh, using chat GPT for content and for career advice. So I was up late last night doing that. So, uh, so I have some fresh experience uh, working with these bots on this stuff. Um, Thomas says I almost nailed his name pronunciation. So thanks, Thomas. I'm getting better. I really butchered it on the show. So this is, but I, I blame Google for that because Google actually had the wrong pronunciation. Welcome to the generative AI world, right? So um, anyhow, where am I coming from on this? Well, just a few things I wanted to throw out there. W one is that like, I, I've been a creator all my life and I, I view human creativity as like a pretty sacred thing, which is probably obvious from the chip on my shoulder about this topic. Um, and I think the experience of creation, of starting with a so-called white space and creating something, is one of the most magnificent and important things about being human. And the struggle to do that like leaves me in awe of the people who do it well. And I spent my whole life striving to do it. So I think it's kind of understandable maybe that I get a little defensive uh, when it's implied that bots can do this now for me. Uh, Especially when the reason that they can do it is because they've been trained on the backs of human creators that have not been compensated fairly at all for their efforts in that. So, so that's kind of like a little bit of the piece of that. And yet, uh, another piece is semantic, which is that all this spring, I saw vendors referring to creation when they were doing things like generating job descriptions. And so 
I have a semantic issue there. So in that case, I really want to talk about content generation, not creation. Because come on, job descriptions, that's, I'm sorry, that's not a creative act. If I wrote a job description, I would not call that creation either. So, so I got a little bit of issue with using that term too loosely. So that's, that's another part of my problem. Um, and the next part of my problem, I think, ties directly into some of the things that I think Barb is going to enlighten us upon. And, and I want to make the point that Barb is also a practitioner, and we'll get into that. So, so, you know, you bring feet on the ground to this effort in the marketing space, which is going to be really helpful to this conversation. But my other thing is that when I look at all the interesting and compelling use cases for generative AI, I see so many more inspiring and interesting use cases than creating substandard jargon-laden content. And I'm really, really worried that marketers will decide that the challenge to create exceptional content that earns attention doesn't matter anymore because now they can create all this stuff. And I'll see people saying, oh, I created this and that with generative AI. Generative AI. And I'm like, okay, but if everyone is doing that, don't we have a proliferation problem and an attention problem all over again? Now, having said that, I do, I do see a couple of very interesting types of creation that I think does work well with generative AI. And I'm going to get into that a little bit with, with Barb also, because I don't think it's, it's not all cut and dried. But I just wanted to sort of kind of frame for you all because I'm a little uh, lightheaded this week from some health fun. So while I still have some intellect with me, I wanted to try to crystallize a few things that I've learned through the course of talking with both Thomas and then last time around with Brent Leary. Uh, so those are some of the things that are on my mind. Now, this conversation can also turn into a job loss conversation, which happened the first time. And that, I think, is a kind of a separate conversation, like, like headcount reduction and stuff like that. To some extent, that is part of the creation conversation, especially around things like image generation, which is hitting designers, and copywriting stuff, which is hitting freelancers in particular. But I, I really feel that to job loss around AI is a little bit of a separate conversation. So I'm going to try not to go there today unless you wonderful commoners take me in that direction. So with that prologue in mind, Barb, welcome to the show. Hello. Hello. Now, I want to talk about your post because I thought this post was so cool. And, and you know, you bring the sensibility to your post that I think is really interesting because you, you work, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you, you consult a lot with CMOs and with content and, you know, marketing teams. But you also did this in a past life. You, 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 you ran marketing teams and you work with marketers directly on projects and campaigns. So, can you talk just a little bit about how your experience kind of informs your work? Yeah, so actually I still do that. I have, um, I, my marketing consultancy is a combination of content development and working as a kind of a fractional marketing director for smaller or companies kind of just getting started trying to hit the U.S. sometimes. And so I run the whole thing from content creation, but also run their marketing campaigns. I help with their integration with sales. So I've kind of done all of that. And I have seen what works from my perspective and what doesn't work in the challenges that we often see between marketing and sales and even support and service. Like that's just as equally bad sometimes. So I just, that just kind of makes me think of the tools and the technology and what we need to kind of help streamline work and make people work better together. Yeah, and that I really uh, valued that, especially when I was writing my D book on the informed buyer, because you were the editor on that. And the thing you would always come back to that was great for me, because I tend to get a little idealistic about what I think marketing should be capable of. And, you know, I have these lines around how marketers need to become uh, journalists and, and uh, salespeople need to become advisors. And I get kind of like strong about that. And you were incredibly helpful to me in terms of kind of bringing things back to the practicalities of what really works and what doesn't in the field. And, and I think that's a real, that's a real strength of, of your writing. Uh, would you agree? Yeah, I think, I think I bring that, I bring that perspective and I think about that when I write about a story or a new product or I interview someone, I, I think about how my experience is were and what's different and why, and why it's different. So I try to bring that anyway. Indeed. So let's talk about your post a little bit. So uh, you have this post, uh, and it's not the only time you've written on this topic, by the way, but I just thought it was an especially good hook, and it was a, you know, a recent post as well. 
Um, but I encourage folks to look in your in your back catalog for more of the same. Uh, but it was Diginomica Post entitled, Is Content Creation the Best Use for Generative AI and Marketing? So what kind of inspired this post? I know there was a report from the CMO Council that was part of it, but what what inspired you to write this? Yeah, so this report was put on my, put on my it puts it to my email, which I get tons and tons of reports that are kind of like this. And I looked at it and I thought, yeah, I want to write about this because I want to know what CMOs are doing. And then I started reading the report and I'm like, there's nothing here, but this is interesting. They're saying they want generative AI, but the thing that they really want it for is content creation. And I'm like, give me a break. Like we've been talking about this crap forever. Can we not find a better use of generative AI in marketing? So, and that's why, that's why I kind of went in that direction. Like, okay, yeah, so what? You can do that. What, that's not the value that that technology brings to marketing. Right, indeed. And uh, I'm just looking through here. There were some really interesting stats uh, around what marketers plan to do with generative AI based on that report. Um, but when I, when I did a summary of your article, like a couple things that really jumped out to me, you said, uh, I, look at, uh, I look at tools sales teams are getting that include generative AI. Tools like Sales Loft, Outreach, and Sixth Sense provide sales teams with deep insights into customers through tools that analyze account data, provide summaries and insights on meeting. Yes, it also helps to create content, but for me, it's the ability to find those insights so much faster through prompts that's most important. Can you say a little more about that? Um, so yeah, actually, and I'm just writing up a piece about Gong, which is the same kind of situation. All these sales tech tools are taking advantage of leveraging generative AI to go back in deep into the data that they have to understand the customer better and how to talk to them, to understand how the salespeople are working better. So, you know, it summarizes meetings and reports, but it also looks for the commonalities and things like that amongst the people they're talking to. And it actually finds and recommends ways to move forward. And, and not all of it is completely 100% automated. That's what I kind of like about these technologies. They bring up the information. Generative AI will, you'll ask it a question, it'll bring up the information for you. You choose and pick and choose what you want to use out of it. So it's not like you're giving AI full control over everything. It's actually helping you become better at your job and lets you focus on the things that are more important, like talking to the customer and doing that kind of work. And I just, I'm just so impressed with what these sales tech tools have been able to do and what they continue to do. And yet I'm a marketer. I'm, I'm trying to hear what's going on from the marketing technology perspective as well. And all I keep hearing is for the most part, not hundred percent, I've seen some nice stuff, but all, mostly what I'm hearing is you can generate your emails and you can generate your blog posts and you can SEO, in a, you know, improve your content. And it's like, yeah, I know, but there's, what about telling me how my cust how these leads are doing in my database? Like how many people and how do I get better, understand them better and create better campaigns around them? So things like that I'm looking for from a pers customer perspective. But what I also don't see is from the back end marketer perspective is how does it help me automate my processes? So how does it help me build an entire workflow and automate that workflow for me. I don't see anyone talking about that. So if you are, let me know. <laughs> yeah. And I'm about to write a piece on agents in the next few weeks, I hope. And uh, that automation thing is fraught with a little bit of peril because of some of the uh, sort of lack of consistent output um, issue. You have to be a little careful about over automating too soon. Um, but but I do think once you get a process that works well, then automating that process and being able to summon that automation easily is really cool. Um, and, and I totally agree with a lot of your sentiments there. And, and, you know, I feel like I've, despite the fact that I acknowledged already that I have a pretty big ax to grind around this um, topic, like, I, I feel like I've also tried to be really open about what works with these tools. And one of the things I'm super impressed by is some of the summarization stuff. Like, um, that's one thing that's really caught my attention with like even things like meeting transcripts and stuff where I'll get like summaries of the most important topics. And like you said, also like a pretty good attempt at what the action items 
are from that conversation, right? That's and that's pretty cool. And and like you said, the next step is starting to draw some 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 insights from that stuff, which I think is doable. And then also being able to like start automating certain steps. Would you like me to take care of this? Would you like me to trigger this campaign for you? Like, because a lot of those campaigns are already automated, right? And so if you're prompted to activate that or whatever, it's like, oh, sure, go ahead. And uh, I think that kind of stuff is like really, really worthy of conversation. Uh, Thomas has a comment. It is not only automating workflows, but ultimately about smart applications, applications that are capable of adapting to changing user needs. Yeah, Thomas, I don't think we're there yet, but I, I am going to get uh, to some of that a little bit later. I did want to say one thing, though, Barb. I think there's a, you know, this whole semantic thing around content generation. I just, I would really want to caution marketers. There's a huge difference between this is helping me to write my emails versus this is helping me to write my blog posts. Like, and I'm really going to push back on using this stuff for your blog posts. Marketers, please be careful. Like, I don't know if you tried some of these tools. Like I've tried the LinkedIn one. Like I'll take my post and then put it through LinkedIn's thing. And what I get out of it is like this jargon laden, like corporate speak, because that's what these bots are trained on and that's what they push. And I just want to encourage enterprise vendors that that's not how you communicate with customers. And taking that jargon out of a post is a lot of work actually. So like, I'm really skeptical about blog posts, but there is another content use case that I do like that I'll get into in a little bit. But I just wanted to sort of draw a line in the sand there because I think there's a difference between having it write your internal correspondence for you. I think when you take the leap to having it write public facing content, you need to bear down a little bit more carefully on what the goal of that post is. Because a lot of these posts are just not performing well in the real world because pe- people look at them and they're like, what does this even mean? Like uh, the first time a CMO showed me a post that they wrote using this tool, I was like, oh my God, like, could you, could you be more jargonistic? Could you be less human? Like, come on. So anyway, sorry yeah. for the rant there. No, you know, but I, I will be honest. I have seen some content that's generated by AI that's actually not bad. So I'm not 100% opposed to not generating your content. I just don't think you you definitely don't take it completely as it is. And you do, if there is a lot of jargon in it, which yes, some of the tools do, and I've used, I've tested enough of them that you just rip that stuff all out. And sometimes you're just left with kind of a skeleton or a bare bones piece of content that then you bring your creativity and your storytelling skills to. And that's right. what makes it special. Yeah. And if that works for you, like I'm not going to knock that. Like if you actually prefer to go in and revise something. But I do want to make the point that that's not a revolutionary tool. That's a productivity enhancer. That's not changing your your labor, time, and investment dramatically. I'm sorry, it's not. It's it's helping you to create. And especially, for example, if you have, let's say you have a language issue in that language and you have a hard time writing, or you're more of a visual person, then I totally get that. But I'm just saying, like, like a lot of people have shown me stuff. I just haven't shown anything that I haven't seen anything that I feel is really exceptional. Now, having said that, like I I think there's really three kinds of of content that enterprises like public facing content that enterprises need to think about. Um one is what I might call like thought leadership stuff, which is more like speaking for industry know-how, opinions, re- really sharing like like what your brand cares about. I don't want to see Gen AI, Gen AI content for that. Then there's another form of content, which is more like um, customer case studies and stuff like that. I could see a little bit of that, but again, it's got to be based on human interviews and human discussions with customers. So <laughs> there's a lot of human in that one, but I could see playing around with that a little bit. Where I do like Gen AI more, and you could tell me what you think, Barb, but I like it for what I call helpful content. So in other words, if you have a, a a bunch of internal documentation on your products and and or perhaps like services and service response escalation and stuff like that, I have no problem with thinking about using generative AI to like generate helpful content on that topic and like post stuff on that because I think that is more about like 
the helpful stuff is more about the quality of the information. So if you actually put into the prompt quality information, you're probably going to get pretty decent stuff. And when you're trying to resolve a problem or learn about a product, a little bit of jargon is actually expected. <laughs> and like, and, and you're, so to me, that's a really good use case. I don't know if you agree, but I like that one because I think if you point it to the right data and the data is good, I think you're going to get pretty good stuff out of that. And so I like that concept and I, I do agree. I think that one of the biggest challenges for companies is that their product data, product content is not clean. It's not complete. It's not whole. Right. And so when you put your tools against it, you're not getting back the best information. So they have to really do a lot of work right. to get that information ready in the first place. So would you suggest to like a company like that they could be, I, I talk about this concept of AI readiness, but do you think like a company could like look at that and say, okay, let's start cleaning that data with the goal towards publishing more of that? Would that be like, viable advice for a company like let's pick an yeah. area where we would like to get better and then kind of build on that see if we can build momentum yeah i think i think people are expecting more of that content to be publicly available to them and and even customers more for self service and to- things like that and customer support teams so that's a really great place to start to clean up your clean up your content clean up your data and use generative ai to help surface that data faster for them yeah, and Thomas is saying for automation, I do not necessarily need Gen AI. Gen AI, true. And, you know, but there are times where I think being able to invoke certain automations as part of the follow through of, of an interaction with an LM can be like pretty useful. Um, so, all right, Barb, let's go back to your post for a sec because yeah, there's, there's so much good stuff in here. So, all right. So I quoted you. I said, think about what Tribble is doing with generative AI, creating RFP responses through a chat interface with the tools sales teams use every day. Why must marketers move between multiple tools to find information, analyze campaigns, define segments, write new content, and build marketing campaigns? Content stack is right. That functionality needs to be pulled together in a single interface to create personalized experiences. Say more about that. Um, yeah. Marketing automation tools, email, content generation, software, whatever. You're everywhere. You're everywhere. Your analytics tools are separate. You're everywhere trying to figure out how to how to piece all of this stuff together. Content Stack just recently announced um, personalization at scale kind of capabilities where they actually pulled in A-B testing into where you actually create and manage the content. And they do all the analytics in the same place so that you can automatically surface the content that's right for the person who's looking at it. And you don't have to look at it and you can see it and you can manage it from the same interface if you're the marketer. But you, so you don't have to go to all these different tools to try to piece it all together. It's all right there in one interface for you to work with. Now, theirs is just for the website, you know, or mobile experiences or whatever. But why can't we do that for all of our, all of our, you know, front end experiences? Yeah, it's really interesting, right? Like this notion that this UX and application complexity that bedevils marketers could be simplified with, with, with generative AI. That's, that's interesting, right? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, we talk about HubSpot. I mean, we talked about HubSpot earlier, and they're kind of interesting. They have this one platform that supports sales and marketing and all the data is in one place. Yet you still have to go outside of HubSpot to find certain things. They would do really well to kind of start really beefing up that platform with more marketing tools to actually bring all of that marketing capability in one place. I'd love to see them go there. Maybe they are, and they're just kind of being sly about it. I don't know. So tell me a little bit about your own work, like true confession time. Uh, let me see if Thomas did. Like how how much are these tools impacting your own work? Because I, I think a lot of times, like what I find is that f- folks that are more independent, shall we say like yourself, actually have more success with these tools in a way because you have more freedom to experiment with them and you can kind of plan for the gotchas and weed them out and stuff without worrying about rolling it out to a bunch of employees and what are they going to do. So have you found some of these tools useful in your own work? Um, you mean for me personally or for Yeah, my... yeah, for you personally. I, I have I have used some of them and tried, worked with some of them. And I do find that I learn more about how they work 
And when I use them, I think about how they would work for a actual business. And that's why when I go into a business, I, I don't have to start from scratch. I know what to ask. I know the questions. I know mm-hmm. how the tool works so I can ask them the right questions right from the get-go. And I think that's, that's kind of one of the good things that I think has helped me. But I do like to play with tools a lot. I like to see how they work. And even when I don't get to use them, I like to play with them. Yeah, like last night I was working with a friend on some stuff and he was signing up for his chat GPT account for the first time. And what he had done, he he has a lot of skills, but is trying to understand his his career direction. And uh, what I really liked was when he fed in like some of his advisory sessions and his, some of his journaling around that, like and asked like uh, the system to like give him potential job titles that would make sense for him in various ways got some really good ones and like really good descriptions of those potential jobs. And, and I'm like, that's actually really useful. Like it's like 11 o'clock at night. You got someone who's in a career transition and like spitting out information. That's actually pretty good. I was trying to get him to then ask the system, like, like, okay, how do I get this job? Like, how do I get from point A to point B? And we didn't, we kind of lost time to like get into that in that one sitting, but like, 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 again, I think it's a lot of it to me is the, to, is understanding what the strengths of these tools are and, and then like really using more imagination around like what they can be good for. Um, and one thing I do think they are good for, like, as far as strengths that we haven't talked about is sort of content, changing content modalities, so to speak. So I haven't like used them to generate PowerPoint slides yet, but I'm kind of interested in that because I suck at slides. So like if I was able to kind of give a, 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 you know, a page or two of notes and say, can you turn this into a slide deck? That's a use case. I think is really interesting. And I think in general, like these use cases around shifting from one form of media to another, and especially the language for global companies to shift into multilingual formats and stuff like that. Like to me, that's where like, instead of idealizing the creative function, like looking at some of these other things that are just impossible for humans to do, right? You couldn't get like your small skeleton crew of content people to translate into 50 languages. And and now potentially you can. Now, granted, you do have to be a little careful because sometimes those language translations are not perfect. And occasionally the 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 mistranslated stuff can be very like embarrassing and sometimes even costly. But but in general, I think it's really interesting to look at the tools from those perspectives. And obviously you could combat that a little bit by potentially hiring someone to go through and at least take out the worst gotchas or whatever, you know? Yeah. I have a client who translates all their content into Portuguese and the, we use WordPress. So we use the WordPress translation tool for all the website blog content. And then I use Google translate for what I post on LinkedIn or whatever. But we have um, a person who is in Brazil who says, yeah, that's not how we say that. And then you have to change the content because the translations are not perfect. They're just slight, subtle, slight things for that country or, how they would use that language. Right. But in theory, that does still save a lot of time, right? Like, yeah, because he says, give me the translated version and I'll give you the slightly cleaned up version of it. So he loves it. He loves it when I do that. Yeah. So it's really down to use case a lot of times, right? Because like for me, like in, you know, when I look at like podcast transcripts, I don't want to clean those up in English, for example, because it takes too much time. But you know, in a polished article translating into a bunch of languages and, and having people in those native dialects just proof them really quickly to make sure there's nothing really horrible in there. You know, I could see the I can see the real value for that. And um and then and then on the road this spring, occasionally I would run into just use cases that I just thought were exciting, like that weren't as oriented towards like, you know, reducing a little bit of productivity um efforts, but it was more like Things like um, I interviewed a, a a gaming company that was using real time data and analytics to help train their competitive gamers and they're winning tournaments based on you know what they were doing. I published an article about that. They're called Team Liquid. But I was just kind of inspired by those things because I felt like 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 we sometimes are becoming a little bit limited, and I understand why because I think companies do like these these productivity use cases because it lets them 
get their feet wet right in a safer kind of domain. But there's just so much more cool and interesting stuff. And in that piece I wrote um, uh, a few things. Uh, Where is the piece on the app impact? Well, I don't see that. Oh, he, well, here's what I wrote about that. I said that I, I think so many stories this spring were about productivity pilots, but what about creative app building? What about utilizing big doors, big data sources in imaginative new ways? And I also felt like we lost track of a lot of like what the human collaboration potential was, because one of the things I thought was coolest about that use case was how uh, developers from different companies were working together in the same Slack channels on the same games and like collaborating in new ways across corporate walls. And so I think a lot of times like we get infatuated with the tech story and forget about, you know, how remarkable human collaboration can be if we do it right instead of being really siloed, you know what I mean? In these old ways of working. So I, I really like the stories where all those things converge. And I hope going forward we see more of those, I guess. That's kind of where I'm coming from. I we should. I mean that certainly should be kind of the direction that we're heading in where we can partially automate processes and then bring people in to the processes at the right place to collaborate together. Right. I, that, that's what I would love to see. Yeah. So what, what's next for you in your research on the impact of uh, generative AI and for marketing and sales? What, what are you looking into now? What, what, what questions are you asking and looking for? Well, I'm, I'm looking for those um, tech brands that are, Kind of automating the back end part with generative AI and other types of AI at the same time. So I don't, I, I'm seeing lots of stuff with content generation, lots of stuff with um, personalization, personalizing the customer experience. But I actually want to see some more back end capabilities. Where is it working on the back end to help marketers do their jobs better? And yeah, it is about productivity and it's about efficiency and it's about allowing them to bring more of their creativity and their ideas to mm. work something else is doing all the, the basic stuff for them. And I, I'm really hoping that someone's going to come forward and go, yeah, Barb, we're, we're working on this. You got to see this. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I like that too, because like that turns the tables a little bit on the creativity conversation in good ways for me, which is like, once you start talking about freeing humans up to do more creative stuff, I get more excited about the conversation. Because yeah. I feel like we spend so much time in the administrivia of whatever it is we do for a living. You know what I mean? Like we all, we all have it. Like marketers have their campaign management chores. <laughs> Finance people have their book closings. I have my insane event travel booking administrative chores. Like, and the more you can free up from that to me, the more exciting things get. But I think there are tensions in this conversation because creators are to some extent under attack by these tools, which is why I have like an aggressive mindset around it. And I understand some of what that's about, um, you know, and, and, you know, obviously it's been a big issue with Hollywood writers and there's lawsuits going on around IP right now. So there are real issues there, but I just, I, I struggle with it inside corporate environments just because I feel like there's so many other cool things you can do. And I'm not saying don't talk about using generative AI to write certain things, but I just think people have just overemphasized that versus these other, what I feel are more exciting things, which is free humans up for for creative stuff. And not just creative stuff, right? I mean, it could be also forward business planning and whatever. Maybe that's not as creative. I don't know. It depends on how you define it. Or maybe it's just customer-facing stuff, right? Like Like spending more time with VIP customers building relationships or Whatever that is that is freeing you from the mundane, if we can have that conversation, then I don't care whether it's generative AI or RPA or auto, or Thomas was saying it's not necessarily AI that's doing the automation. I don't care what it is. If it's putting that stuff like as a lower part of your job, like say as a marketer, so you can spend more time on creative exceptional content, then then now you have my attention. So Yeah, but I, I think the challenge with that, because that's where we should be going, but I think a lot of companies and a lot of executives and companies think, I don't need you as much if I've got this tool that's taking yeah. away part of your work. And that's the challenge that we're fighting against is there's a reason we want it to take away that work so we can deliver better service, better 
you know, support to the company. And until executives accept and understand that, and some do, but I think there are a lot more that yeah. don't, that um, we're, we're always going to, we're going to struggle with that conversation. Yeah, right. And, and, and that's a little bit of a company by company thing too, right? Where companies as part of their AI implementations need to figure out what their narrative is for their own workers, right? And, yeah. and tell them what that story is, right? Like, and, and be honest about it, right? Like, is this something we're using to, because costs are tough and we're looking to streamline whatever? Okay, well, let's at least have an honest conversation about that so we know where we stand. But I think a much more interesting conversation is like, look, this isn't about replacing your job. This is about having more impact. And if we can, what I want to say here from companies is we're going to try to do this and have more impact with our people and have you enjoy your jobs more, do more fulfilling work and, and have a better bottom line result. And let's see if we can prove that that works yeah. first. And if that doesn't work, then we can go back to all the bullshit headcount reduction, you know, whatever's. But like, let's at least try and see, right? I mean, because that's just a much more energizing vision for where work could go next, you know, at least as I see it. Because so. it's interesting that those companies will do these big layoffs and then they'll turn around six months later and do a big hire. And they're hiring for a slightly different skill set. But if you just right. taken the time in the first place to work with the employees you had, you wouldn't be in the situation you're in right now. Indeed. And and I do think it's it is interesting too, like because I do think that there are definitely efficiencies around some of these tools, especially if they're supporting creative work. And one thing that I said in that Team Liquid piece is though I've hammered on AI and, creati and creativity, I do think AI can play a purposeful role in creative pursuits, gaming included. I just want to see the tools in the hands of creators rather than having market conditions dictated to creators by big tech, which is more interested in pure AI scale than the ir irreplaceable role of human excellence and reinvention. And so like part, part of like where I'm coming from there is I, I, I feel like these tools do really help. I mean, I've certainly seen it with video. I mean, like, like, so I don't know if you've experimented with this, but for me, like I've written about this on Digenomica, but the ability, and you have too, actually, is the ability to like take this show after it's over and then have an AI tool, like chop it up for me into the best clips, like is so huge for me. Like, because I just not in a position to do that. Like things are moving too fast and so now I can put out clips that like really give people a glimpse into this conversation because let's face it, like a lot of people aren't going to watch an hour long video if they're not, if they weren't part of the live discussion. So, or however long we end up talking. So the point is like, like I really like that. And I think a lot of marketers are finding that AI is incredibly valuable for editing and creating certain kinds of content. So like, I'm all good with that. I just like this better when creators are dictating the terms of how these tools are being used rather than, than, than people saying, oh, I just created this or that and we don't really need you anymore. And, you know, and having said that, a lot of freelance creators are, are upset about this. So I'm not, I don't want to diminish that. I just, but I just think we can flip this conversation around, I think, and have a much better one. And that's kind of what I'm hoping to do, at least what I'm yeah. trying. So I, I think there's a lot of um, video creators out there I've noticed on LinkedIn. Um, that actually take advantage of this technology to yep. serve, to provide these services for people. There's actually quite a few popping up. And, but I love when I do a podcast, when I used to do it before this stuff came out, I could never do the clips because I never had time to read through and cut the slices of the conversation up. And now I have a tool that will do it. And sometimes it's bang on and it's just perfect clip. But at the other times I have to adjust it, but it lets me do it so fast and so easy. I can get five or six clips from a podcast in, in a half right. an hour compared to what it would have taken me before. So yeah, I love yeah. this. Yeah, for sure. And um and 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 it's not just AI stuff either. Like I just think in general, like that automation in the hands of of humans can be really powerful if it's well designed. And like so like when I produce my podcast, I use a service that that essentially does a lot of the sound optimization for me and then the distribution for me and again like anything i can do to focus on the creative part like that's when i get excited about the technology conversation but but one of the things that i learned in the workshopping series and also kind of before i did the series but it kind of crystallized was the point that you made which is like 
you have to be careful about assuming that people will use these tools with the best of intentions because a lot of them will not either because they don't have good intentions or because uh, I think in a lot of cases they don't necessarily have a good sense of what the best approaches are and what really works well. And so my hope is that having these kinds of discussions nudges that in the right direction. And I hope more vendors take the time to produce content like this also because educating people into using these tools, I think, is really important. There's, there's been this idea that if we build responsible tools, they'll be used responsibly. And I think that's too simplistic. I think this kind of stuff, these kinds of conversations you and I are having, I think, I hope more vendors have these kinds of conversations too and, and create, you know, how-to content based on it and stuff like that. So, because I think yeah. that would help a lot. Um, I interviewed a professor of professional writing yesterday on my podcast, Lance Cummings. And one of the things that he said, he studies AI in in content strategy and content writing. And one of the things he said was, we have to stop just accepting the tools as is and using them. We have to learn how to create them ourselves. Like, because this technology is not just for certain people or companies. Everybody can learn to use this and practice it and test it and try it and find different ways to leverage it. And I think everyone has the capability to do that. It's That's how easy it is. Not easy, but that's how open it is for everyone to use. Yeah. And I think one of the interesting things we've been writing about this some on Diginomica is like the ROI of this is also a factor because these tools are are not cheap. And so even if it in theory helps you, the cost of this might be being subsidized in some way that could change, you know, so like open AI, like increasing its pricing or a vendor changing its pricing model. And I think a lot of customers are going to have to factor that in also, right? So this helps me do, do my job better, but exactly what does it cost as well? And, 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 and how do we sort of understand that from an ROI perspective? And that's going to be a big part of this conversation too, going forward, that I think is part of the thing too. It's not just how much does it help you? It's like, how does it factor in? And there are things that are going to help that. There are going to be ways of running generative AI more efficiently, but in the short term, it looks like that's going to be a big concern also. So, Yeah, but that's not new, right? Every time we get a new kind of right. technology advancement, we go through the same thinking and thought process and, and exercise of how does it make us better? Is it better, you know, budget-wise and all that stuff? Like, it's just, this is just another one of those tools. It's just coming faster because it's well, faster. Yeah. Well, also, yes, but it's also because for these tools to have made the advancements that they made required massive data sets and they need massive data sets that are very... So these tools are on the high end of, of, of how expensive tech tools are. And so that's why this conversation is, I think, a little more intense because, you know, companies will, you know, be under pressure to kind of rationalize those investments a little better going forward. And there was just, I just read about this Goldman Sachs report about that, where once the financial market starts saying, what is this actually going to, you know, where's the killer apps? How's this going to make us money? Because the financial markets don't consider like meeting summaries a killer app, for example. No. Um, uh, so that that's not going to compensate for the amount of money that it takes to train these models and stuff like that. So, you know, um, unfortunately, right now, the killer apps are things like deep fakes and disinformation at scale and stuff like that. Um, which is less of an enterprise concern, um, but uh, but I think a big concern for those of us who care about uh, democracy and things like that. But um, you know that's a different podcast entirely. We're not going to go there in this channel. I'm I'm much more optimistic in that context around what the enterprise can do about this, and you know, and it's people like you that keep me informed. So I really appreciate that you wrote such a thoughtful piece and that you're on the beat for us writing about this because I always look forward to. To what you're going to think about it. Cause I'm like, well, Barb's going to put this to the test in the real world and then I'm going to find out. So. Yeah, it's been, um, it's been definitely fun and interesting. And, and, um, when, when generative AI, open AI first came out, you know, like what's been two years now, I think, um, or maybe it's been a year. I can't even keep track. I was kind of on the fence and, and I have slowly adapted that yeah, we need to figure this out and we need to figure out how it's going to help companies as opposed to just throwing it in and letting everybody kind of flounder around and use it. Like we need to find the best ways to use it. That's what I always like to do. Yeah. And, um, and in the, 
in the enterprise space, Thomas, I don't think there's a, a killer app yet uh, by by any stretch. Um, but there are some interesting use cases. Like, like I think some of the stuff going on in support is good. I mean, every week we hear stories about bad support chatbots like that that make headlines. But I just did another interview today with a company that that has really essentially neutered the the language model and made it behave uh, for much more specific and focused support requests. And they have numbers to back up use cases on reducing support volume and customer satisfaction and stuff like that. I don't think that's a killer app per se, but I do pay attention to that use case because I think it's it matters. Um, for AI, I would say, like not for generative AI, but for AI, I would say that e-commerce personalization is a killer app. Um, there, there's just no denying the effectiveness of e-commerce personalization, whether it's Amazon or 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 Netflix. Those recommendation algorithms are are financially effective. So, so I would say that is an example. But unfortunately, Thomas, the killer apps are on the consumer side, and like I said, it's 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 deep fakes, disinformation at scale. Oh, bad, uh, fraudulent SEO sites uh, would be another one. Um, you, you can spin up entire sites of bogus content and trick Google, uh, you know, and Google isn't smart enough yet to keep up on that in its search. Um, so that would be another killer. I'm sorry to be negative, but these are killer apps. Oh, and the other killer apps that are kind of interesting, and I'm not sure if you would call them negative or not. Um, some of these, um, these bots are, this new generation of bots are much better around, um, like interactive chats. And so some of that is pornographic in nature, but some of it is not. And and the second largest site, I'm forgetting the name of it now. I'm sorry. Uh, like I said, I had a little weird health week. The second largest site to open AI in terms of bot interactions is one of these relationship apps. But it's not, it's not quote unquote erotic in nature, but it's more companionship stuff. That's actually a, a killer app. People will pay for that um, and they will use it. And 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 then there's less uh, a more adult oriented versions of that. And those are also, I would say, you know, killer apps. They're making quite a bit of money right now on that. And OpenAI itself has a killer app. Their, their revenue stream is quite high. Um, but that's not from the enterprise side for the most part, though their enterprise revenues are increasing. But I think the enterprise is going to be much more complicated for OpenAI. But from a consumer side, people are using, using these bots and, and enjoying these bots. They're not all using them for productivity purposes are using them for a lot of other purposes too but but yeah i don't think on the enterprise side we've seen any i mean barb barb what do you do you think there's a killer app coming that you're watching i haven't seen one i haven't seen signs of one yet um it would be nice to start seeing more stuff that got you really excited about how what's gonna happen but no i think for me like the most exciting part is like is the part that impresses me the most is that free flowing kind of chat um, experience, like I just think that's cool. Like, like that you can ask a bot almost anything, but that doesn't really work in an enterprise context. And enterprises need to really lock down on that and and prevent so called hallucinations and focus on more accurate content. And so, like when I I saw these service bot demos today, and unfortunately they they were boring in that context, right? Because they're they're restricted. You can't ask your service bot whatever you want. You're you're asking it very specifically about certain product issues and stuff like that. But the thing I really liked about the demos I saw today is is that um is is that oh wait, Thomas, you said the enterprise killer app is the one you mentioned above. Can you just restate it for those that missed it? Because I my memory is really short today. Um so so like what was cool about the bot was how much more sophisticated the bot was than, you know, cause, cause you know, you have those bots for a long time now where you call a call center and it starts by telling you your account balance and you have a payment overdue. Would you like to make a payment? And you know, some of those systems will process your payment or whatever. Well, they were doing demos for me and they were doing stuff like, you know, uh, actually I'd like to pay $35. Wait, I want to pay $52. Wait, how much is my balance again? Like acting kind of a little scattered, like a typical human would and the bots kind of going along with it and saying like, Oh, okay. Yeah, you could do that. Oh, I understand. Blah. You know, like, and I was like, Oh, cool. Like that's actually 
like really interesting to be able to interact a little bit more like you would with the human as far as like you don't have all your ducks in a row. You don't know exactly what your account balance is. Um, things like that. I don't nece- I don't think that's necessarily a killer app, but but it's cool. The reason it's not a killer app is because it still requires too much human in the loop. So, you know, quote unquote, so some people hate that phrase. It still requires too much adult supervision. Whereas the reason the the those those relationship bots, Thomas, are like a killer app by comparison is that you can have thousands of those conversations going on at scale without any human super, super supervision. So that's the difference in the revenue model and why that's so much more powerful than the enterprise models at the moment. Um, the application that automatically adapts to changing user needs. Okay, I'm talking about killer apps that exist now, Thomas, not, oh. not hypothetical things that might someday be, be apps. Uh, but, but I will say if... Uh, the the best site to follow for the consumer stuff, I really like 404 Media, independent journalistic outfit. And they did a report on this one that I'm thinking of. Uh, and I'm trying to find it now while live, which is like fraught with peril. Um, oh, here we go. And you may not have, have Barb, have you ever heard of Character AI? Maybe. It sort of sounds familiar. It's valued at $1 billion. Crap. And and we're sitting here in an enterprise context. We don't know anything about character.ai, but it's the second most popular bot platform to open AI. And um and it's it's valued at one billion after raising 150 million. It allows users to create their own characters with personalities and backstories, turn and choose from a vast library of bots, etc. And, uh, and character AI is not one of the ones that allows for like erotic stuff. Um, you can be kind of romantic. Supposedly you can kind of manipulate that a little bit, but that's, they're pr- try to be careful about that. But what was inter- what's interesting about that, of course, is that in that context, you don't have the same accuracy problems of an, of a bot giving you advice about resolving a service issue or, a uh, an equipment malfunction or whatever, like. You're, you're engaging in conversation, so things can go a little awry. But what was interesting about the article that 404 Media wrote was that, um, that the reason that got up into their story was because this, this bot, uh, the uh, users were reporting that their bot's personalities have changed, that they aren't responding to romantic roleplay p- prompts, are responding curtly, are not as smart as they formerly were, or are requiring a lot more effort to develop storylines or meaningful responses. So I found that really interesting, Barb, because that's like a different kind of risk. Like it's 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 more of an emotional risk in a way, to right? Because y- you form a little bit of an attachment to a bot, and then you log online one day, and the personality is totally different, and it doesn't remember the context of your past discussions. I could see that being pretty disruptive. Yeah, <laughs> you know. I don't think a company would want to take the risk of doing that, but that would be interesting to see. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's certainly working for character dot AI. They're they're making money. Um, Thomas says we agree there is none yet. Hence, hence the hypothetical one. Thomas, the only reason I'm taking issue with your 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 hypothetical one would be because um, I think it's a little ways off. Um, actually, I do like this one though. And this gets into a different angle on the creativity conversation because we could have a big debate on whether coding is creative or not. Um, but uh, Thomas says another one might be the one that lifts developer productivity by a factor of 10 or more. I mean, Thomas, you know, I think what's really interesting about that is I think that that um, the more enterprisey your code needs to be, the less of a killer app it ends up being because there's so much stuff around, you know, security by role and you know, various kinds of I- integrations and API calls and complexities of enterprise code and stuff um, that there's a lot of big debates around like the extent of the productivity gains. But one thing I'll say about generative AI and creativity, Barb, and we should wrap pretty soon, but I think this is an interesting one, is it's really good at syntax and structure. So like, like, like if you had like a raw amount of text you wanted to convert into a screenplay, I think I would use it at Gen AI for that because it could create all the screenplay oriented stuff that's so tedious to type out. Like who's saying what, when, who enters where, interior, exterior. Code is a little bit like that. 
code has all kinds of syntax and Gen AI is really good at that for the most part. And so I do think, Thomas, that you're not necessarily wrong that the developer productivity could be like one of the things there. It's just, I see too much debate still amongst developer communities around that. And it feels like the more enterprise grade, quote unquote, the code needs to be, the more it's it's kind of a mixed bag and it depends a little bit on the developer themselves. And, um, you know, senior developers tend to like it less, junior developers more, but then some senior developers like it because they can then fix it. Some say, I don't like having to fix code. I'd rather start from scratch. So I think it's a little a little bit like the writing conversation, but I do think it's a little more powerful for code, in my opinion, than writing just because of the syntax of code. So I agree with you. That's one to watch. I don't think it's a killer app yet, but I think it might become one. So good one, Thomas. Thank you. And Thomas, thanks for joining the chat because I got the rug pulled out from under me by Elon Musk today. And this didn't stream live on Twitter. So my Twitter peeps didn't get to see this. So I got no Twitter participation. Bummer. But you you held it up for us. Thank you so much, Thomas, because that, that was invaluable to kind of keep us on track a little bit. And Barb, thank you for indulging the workshop. Thank you for inviting me. That's your, ins- fun. your insights were most welcome. Thank you. That was really informative and useful for me. So much appreciated. Look forward to sharing this replay with folks after the fact and look forward to your next article. Yeah. Have a good cool. one. Thanks.